Watch that crease. Again, the quick release, able to fire that ball right on. And Fenton, yet again, makes a beautiful save, 14th of the day for him. Walters had scored on that identical shot earlier. Give Fenton credit for making that in-game adaptation, that mental scouting report that all goalies and all athletes go through, whatever your sport is. So that, it's the same move. I'm not going to let him beat me again. So that's a sign of a, of a great goalie. Here is Marshall. He's lefty, lefty, lefty. Warren Thompson out there as well. A deep Duke team at times. But a lot of firepower we told you about. Flattery can't handle that ball. That's over his cross out of bounds. Watch the reaction from Joe Walters. Can't believe it. He's got to vary his shot. Intercept. Greer charges in. Scores! Zach Greer. A new ACC record. 57th goal of the year and four on the day for the Fab Frosch from Canada. He's incredible. He's got a sense of this game, the cutting, the back door, and here it's just an overthrown pass by the Terps. He scoops it up in full stride. Because Presser says, Zach Greer's got no idea what these games are going to be like. Says, I'm excited to see how Zach reacts to 45,000 fans. Breaking the record held by Doug Knight from Virginia back in 96 with a 56 goals. Zach Greer gets it done. One of the incredible offensive threats Duke has. The other, of course, is Matt Donowski. Leads the nation in points coming in. And Janine Edwards is joined by his famous dad. That's right, Coach John Donowski is the head lacrosse coach at Hofstra. And of course, Matt, the ACC Rookie of the Year, led the team in scoring last year. How proud are you of your son's accomplishments? I'm tremendously proud of him as a, as a person and, and what his him and his team have been able to accomplish so far. Do you get nervous watching a big game like this? Absolutely. You know, you're a parent and, and you get the butterflies and you, you get excited and fired up, uh, just like the kids do. Now, from the coach's perspective, what is Duke doing very well right now? Duke overall is just, you know, as I've told people all year, they're a good team. They have a lot of weapons on offense. They play great team defense. Their goalie is terrific. And, and they have a great, uh, a great chemistry, I think. And you can see today, a lot of people scoring goals, a lot of people making plays for them. Okay, well, enjoy the rest of the game. That's Coach John Donowski, Matt's dad. Dave? Unbelievable career already for number 40 in white, Matt Donowski. 4.67, the average is second, but the total points, 85, leads the NCAA. And a young man who grew up on the Hofstra sidelines on Long Island, outstanding high school performer as well. Check in now with the Diet Coke game track. Flannery has five points, 16 by eight different players we talked about. Shots on goal fairly even, Quint, but the pace of the game the defense, all-around play, Duke's been dominant. Yeah, Duke has defensively dominated Maryland, the one-on-one -on -one battles, maybe minus Walters. Aaron Fenton has outplayed Harry Alford uh, between the pipes. And Duke has manufactured goals in so many different ways. Extra man goals, fast break goals, goals off of face-offs, a rebound goal, a riding goal. So this offense is a complete package. They are not one-dimensional. Nick O'Hara, ground ball, off the wing. That face off of the X for Duke. 18 11, they've got that category. Sewn up as well today. Coach Janowski talked about the chemistry that he sees on this Blue Devil Island. Mike Pressler said the same thing earlier in this year. He says, you know, keep it up, Joe. I practice around pick, what, number pick, what, 70 pick. on the season, and not once has he had to talk to his Blue Devils about character, about motivation, about spirit. He said the kids bring it every day. They're loose. They have laughs. But when it's time to work, they get to work. And we saw that yesterday in practice. Very focused, great spirit, and just a hard-working bunch. Ross got decked there on the end line. Push play on call, so Duke keeps it. I'm with you, partner. Duke seemed very loose in their practice and you just get the feel that this team is in complete control of its own destiny their game and their style they play it hard to beat them 
ball came loose and he pushed They did play Johns Hopkins, top ranked top seed of Blue Jays once this year, lost in double overtime. In that one game, if you're thinking about a possible matchup for the final, Hopkins has still got to play Virginia. And the Blue Jays are getting ready. The second national semifinal game to come here on ESPN2. UVA and Hopkins from the semis. Your alma mater has struggled. Snake bit in the semis. Their lone win was in 2003 in Baltimore, where they lost then in the finals to Tillman Johnson in Virginia. But that game's coming up. And Virginia's got a nice track record going against the Hopkins Blue Jays. So this game uh, should be a very, very tight, intense ball game. About 30 minutes, we'll have the face off of that one. UVA and Hopkins. Duke has been in control of this game throughout. After the McGlone tally by Maryland to get things going, if they have been controlling the right point of the game for them. Leading us to our Pontiac game-changing performance. Duke got it going early in transition. The long pole, O'Hara to Flannery, and then Zash off the faceoff. But what a first half Matt Zash had. He had three goals in the first half. Greer with the garbage on a rebound, and then he picks off his clearing pass. Freshman sensation just tearing it up. Trio attack from earlier. We told you how dominating these guys are, and look at the diversified scoring. Today, Flannery leads the group. Coming into this game, Donowski had 10 goals in the NCAA playoffs, and you see the impact that Zach Greer has had. Anytime you have a lefty finisher who can put the ball in the back of the net as well as he can without shooting percentage that high, uh, your offense is just so much better. It's, it's one of those weird positions where when you're a right-handed team, if you have that one lefty, he benefits from everybody. Mm. 11 points combined, terrific trio. Back down to Janine. Any chance for Maryland here, according to Dave Cottle? Well, actually, Dave Slavkowski, the defensive coordinator, was just giving the guy some very specific instructions. He said, hey, if there's a pick behind the goal where you got to double team him, Harry is going to come out front, and they are really pulling out all the stops, guys. They're trying to contain this as much as they can. They're certainly going to have to. Alford with a save there as he denies Marshall. Harry hoping his season has not come to an end. See the saves at 14-8. Fenton has been dominant in that category. I think when Alford goes and looks at this game that first shot the Donowski shot that went off his leg and trickled into the goal and from there it was downhill nine straight Duke goals in the first and second quarter to fled nine to one but as a goalie you, you make that first save and things start bouncing your direction and, and for Harry he never could get that momentum going has surrendered 17 goals on 25 shots from Duke Alford in his first game head-to-head -head with Duke. Ten goals, eight saves, and that 10-8 loss. The second game, 15 saves and the five goals. McGlone trying to get free. Bounce shot. Stays out for Maryland. Have an effort from Ward, and what a catch by Michael Ward. Somehow brought that ball in. Acrobatic play by number nine in the white jersey. Another fabulous effort. Only a sophomore, Ward, in December, went into the coach's office and said, hey, what, what can I do to get more playing time? And the biggest thing was his conditioning. And watching him yesterday in practice, he is just 100% in every single drill Duke does. And here's a guy who has gotten himself game fit through a lot of hard work. Bo Carrington, freshman out of Charlottesville, Virginia. Gets some action here. And scores! On the scoreboard, the freshman international semifinal game. There is a memory to treasure. Lacrosse athletes are evolving. Carrington, 6'4", 210, with speed, power. You can be a small guy and play lacrosse. You can be a 5'8", 5'7", guy, but if you're 6'4", 210, and you drop your shoulder like that, and these sticks don't let the ball pop out very easily. You're, you're going to be a weapon. And you see the excitement, even though it's goal 18. Big picture meaningless in Carrington's world. That's the biggest goal of his life. Goal number one, yeah, for him in the NCAA tournament. Third of the year. Andrew, your court. Helps win the draw for the Terps. Here is Maxwell Ritz, the freshman, younger of the two Ritz brothers. Tries to get free. Older brother Xander. Man wide up in front. Ian Healy tried a quick stick. 
goal, but he couldn't quite find the handle. I'm surprised Duke hasn't substituted their goalie. You put in your backup, Danny Loftus, right now to maybe get him a rep, give him a little game feel here in case you'd need him for some reason on Monday. I'm also Casey. surprised that Danowski is still in the ball game. Casey Carroll with a long stick. Nice intercept for Duke again. Send the ball Danowski. right back. Actually, Danowski is out now. He was in that last possession, but now he is out. Chris Loftus is in, the freshman from Syosset, Long Island. Mike Pressler able to empty the bench here, and why not? Michael Young, 27 and white. Look at that balance and tremendous offensive output. The Cayman averaging 13.3 goals a game. That was the nation's best. 18 today. Ooh, just on the doorstep, bidding for a 19. Play gets physical. Ian Healy. Bounce shot. Fenton shuts the door one more time. Mott's right on the doorstep, trying to rake in a rebound camp. 15 saves for Fenton in the game. 60-yard outlet pass to an attackman. Wow. Now right on the money. How about Matt Russell of Navy, who's so good at that? Captain Joe Kennedy. And they can play more than basketball down in Durham, folks. Can they ever? About 90 seconds away from their first ever appearance in the national championship game. There's a new goalie in for Duke. Dan Loftus, the sophomore, will get some time here in the final moments. Aaron Fenton's day, well done, is finished. Duke just ragging the clock here. They've got to keep this ball in the offensive box. And their fans on their feet. Ray McGill causing some trouble and helping turn it over here for the Terps. Memorial Day weekend means the greatest spectacle in racing. Join ABC Sports at the legendary Brickyard for the 89th running of the Indianapolis 500. Sunday on ABC, coverage starts at noon. See some high-flying lacrosse players in our second of two games here, national semifinal. Virginia Hopkins, the great Kyle Harrison. Looks like he's shot out of a cannon every time he's carrying the ball in the open field. What skills and what a leader. Worth the price of admission. He's a guy I'd pay to watch play. And some 40,000 have done just that. Quick shot, release, goal from Maryland here with just 21 seconds to go in the game. Thomas Alford inside the twin brother of Harry. His catches and releases. Sophomore, St. Albans in D.C. His brother Harry, very close, take the same classes, live in the same off-campus apartment. Maryland Duke looks like Duke is through for sure. And the second game, Hopkins, Virginia, rematch from earlier in the season, beginning of the year, a two-goal win at home when in Baltimore by the Blue Jays. So can Virginia get revenge is the question. It won't be easy. Hopkins comes in undefeated, the only undefeated team left in the nation. And Duke will join them. Duke did play Hopkins once, lost in double overtime at Homewood in Baltimore. We shall see who wins the second game. We know Duke's in. Less than 10 seconds to a trip to their first ever national championship game. The Devils have done it. 18-9 the final for Mike Pressler. All around impressive team effort. Thoroughly dominate the Terrapins today. Nine goal first half run. And you see why they had the number one scoring offense for Maryland. A valiant effort this season. Five and five, they won six straight to get to this point. People wrote them off mid-season. They didn't play their best game today. 
but they got big smiles. The Blue Devils will get to play on Monday. I think playing in the ACC tournament where you played on Friday and then Sunday with one day's rest will really prepare this team for what lies ahead over the next two days. You got to come back on quick rest. You got to get your rest. You got to do some scouting. You got to feel loose and happy, but not too overconfident. You got to come back, and that's a unique challenge. They're saluting their fans right there. Those who have made the trip from Durham, North Carolina, know there is one more step left to climb for the school's first ever national championship. Their head coach, Mike Pressler, 2005 ACC Coach of the Year. Third time he's won that honor with Duke. Five times in Division Three, he made the semis. Three times the national title game at Ohio West, but never a championship for Mike Pressler at any level. Maybe that changes this weekend. Mentored by the great Jack Emmer, who retired this year at Army. The winningest coach, actually, you know Jack's gonna be here on Monday rooting his, his old protege on, but uh, this Duke team, they ramped it up this year. They got it going early and the confidence is there. And this is a team, this is a team. Balance across the board. No, no blatant weak spots on this roster. These teams had met twice before in the NCAA tournament, but never in the semifinals until today. Duke's first trip to the semi since 97 proves to be fruitful. Final of 18-9 coming up. It's the NCAA championship update, and then our second semifinals. Virginia takes on Johns Hopkins for the right to make Duke for the NCAA lacrosse championship. We'll have more our NCAA championship studios. That's coming up. Second double header to come for Quint, Janine, it's Dave saying so long. Watch out, boys. Danica Patrick is trying to make history, but Tony Kanaan is on the pole looking to capture his biggest piece of hardware yet. The greatest spectacle in racing unfolds. The Indianapolis 500, Sunday noon Eastern on ABC. So that's it? I'm hooked up for NFL Sunday ticket? I never thought that I could see all these games on my TV. But now with this dish, I truly see how beautiful life can be. Because I got the Sunday ticket. It's Mike Payton. The NFL Sunday ticket. Check him out. I never thought I'd see the day when I would have the juice to say, Hey, Bud Kiss, come watch the Bears. I never thought that I would see all these games in sweet HD Cause I have said it couldn't be done Oh, it can be done NFL Sunday Ticket NFL Sunday Ticket This is how watching football games should be It's NFL Sunday Ticket from DirecTV So one team has punched its ticket to Monday's national championship, Duke, into the title game for the first time ever, an 18-9 winner over Maryland. So the Blue Devils will play for that trophy on Monday in Philadelphia. Dave Revson alongside ESPN's college lacrosse analyst, Lee Felsmo, as Duke again awaits the winner of our next game coming up in about a half hour or so. It's Virginia against Johns Hopkins, and it is a chance, Leaf, to see the most dominant player in college lacrosse today. That would be Kyle Harrison, and he leads a special senior group, a group that only lost three regular season games in their four years. Number 18, he does it all. Look at him shake and bake, losing those two defenders. The most dangerous player on the field because of his great quickness, his first step, his ability to go right and left, his face-off ability, so he will control the game for Hopkins in the middle of the field but when he gets doubled and he will get doubled he looks for help and he looks for two freshmen to step up that is Rabel and this is Huntley number 24 he's an attackman a freshman from Calvert Hall in Baltimore who has Canadian like shooting instincts and ability he can shoot right and left he's a marksman a sniper and he has come up huge in big wins this year Rabel number 19 a freshman running on Kyle Harrison's midfield Every time Harrison gets doubled, look for Huntley or look for Rabel to get the ball from Harrison and come up with big goals. Both of these guys, Rabel and Huntley, have had hat tricks and some of the biggest wins this year. You certainly begin to understand why this Johns Hopkins team is undefeated. They come in ranked number one in the country. Again, that game coming up in about a half hour. We were talking about Harrison, and Kyle Harrison is a bit of a lacrosse anomaly. He is an African-American, All-American. Of the 313 men and women enshrined to the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame, 
only one of them is black. Jim Brown, of course, great football player, NFL Hall of Famer as well, was a great star at Syracuse back in the 1950s. There's one team from the 1970s that probably did the most for the cause of African Americans in the sport of lacrosse. Be forewarned before we show you this piece, it does contain some racially sensitive language that some people may find offensive. Here's Jeremy Shep. A father playing catch with his son. An American portrait. In Baltimore, though, it's lacrosse, as much as baseball or football, that links the generations. But this father and son share a unique lacrosse history, one forged in the turmoil of the civil rights movement. It is an unhappy truth that racism is a way of life. Baltimore. 1969, the campus of Morgan State University. Set against the backdrop of a country in the throes of a black power revolution, a group of students led by Miles Harrison Jr. had a dream to organize a lacrosse team, the first fielded by an historically black college. Contact sports allowed us legal rights to engage with Caucasian people. And uh, um, so they felt that this was a metaphor for life right now. Our, our struggle on that field uh, bore resemblance to what was going on in America. Oh, make me wanna holler, throw up both my hands. Yeah. These were times when Martin Luther King was assassinated. It was like power to the people. I'm black and I'm proud. And the only way that we could really release this energy was through athletic competition. There were no historically black colleges that ever had a lacrosse team. I don't think they ever thought of having a lacrosse team. Morgan State, though, decided to form a team and tapped Chip Silverman, a 27-year-old white man, as its coach. A Morgan State administrator, Silverman had grown up playing lacrosse but had never coached. I introduced myself. There was a, a player named Stanley Cherry. And he came up at the end of the meeting and introduced himself. He says, hi, name's Cherry, and I hate white people. Wearing discarded football jerseys and wielding makeshift sticks, the Morgan State Bears took the field as a varsity team in 1971. Relying on their size, speed, and strength, the 10 Bears, as the team came to be known, stunned the white lacrosse establishment. Clad in bright orange, they intimidated opponents with their aggressiveness, much of it an expression of their frustration with the racial status quo. Rather than just play another black college or university, we were playing the white boys. And this is the opportunity for us to beat the white boys. And it's an opportunity for us to put some of the white boys in the hospital. If you're a kid from Amherst or Swarthmore coming down here to play Morgan, and you see these guys come at you on the field, it's terrifying. I got a big kick out of that. But even the daunting sight of the Bears did not dissuade some opponents from hurling ugly racial epithets. I told the kids, they're going to try this. And if you let your emotions get the best of you and you get thrown out of the game, you're off the team. They would make uh, comments, you know, like, uh, nigga don't know how to play this game, you know, or things like that. And I would just score another goal and say, well, that's how a nigga scores. You want to deal with these guys? After the game, go up and say, you want to call me a nigger now? The game's over. Uh-uh. They wanted to get out of there now. Few felt the impact of what the Ten Bears were achieving more deeply than Clarence Tiger Davis, a Morgan State graduate and, at the time, a local leader of the Black Power Movement. They were my heroes. And I saw the kind of racism and animosity they encountered. They became even greater heroes to me at that particular time. This team did for sports on the East Coast what Martin Luther King did for blacks all over the country. In the spring of 1975, Morgan State traveled to Virginia 
to play the top-ranked team in the nation, the Washington and Lee Generals, at a school whose name, in part, honors the general who commanded the Confederate Army, the Ten Bears pulled off an historic upset. Washington and Lee. That's the epitome of Southern aristocracy. <laughs> you know, and to take it to Southern aristocracy uh, was a feeling that only a black man could appreciate. <laughs> But five years after defeating the number one team in the nation, Morgan State, in the midst of a fiscal crisis, dropped its decade-old lacrosse program. I don't think there'll ever be a social experiment in sport to parallel what we went through. Um, it almost still brings a tear to my eye when I think about it now in retrospect. It's just. Today, the spirit of the Ten Bears lives on in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, home of one of the most successful programs in college lacrosse. A generation ago, Miles Harrison and his Morgan State teammates would have been unwelcome at Hopkins. Today, Miles' son Kyle is the Blue Jays' most accomplished player. A senior midfielder, he's the team captain and a two-time finalist for the National Player of the Year Award. Running away from the orange, it scores! What an effort, Kyle Harrison! I think it's the ultimate honoring of dad. To have my son not only be accepted, but be one of the cogs in that Hopkins lacrosse machine um, is very, very gratifying to me. For a little black kid, you don't, you don't really have, you know, many people to look up to, and so it's nice to have, you know, the Ten Bears and, and that team at Morgan State, you know, to look, look up to, and you say, you know, those guys did it, you know, why can't I do it? We look at this kid like, we all look at him like our son. Oh, yeah, I played with his dad, you know, that's, that's our boy. Oh, uh, yeah, we're very proud of him, and, and uh, all of us see it. Go to Hopkins games now to watch Kyle. When I see Kyle playing on the field, I do see him in a Morgan uniform. Sometimes it's almost like he goes out of that blue and white uniform and I see that orange pop up on him. And I see the pride going down the field. Miles and Kyle Harrison still play catch. The hard white ball passing from father to son, from the bear to the blue jay, from the past to the present, and back again. Jeremy Schaap reporting. Kyle Harrison's father, Miles, will be in the stands today cheering on his son as Johns Hopkins takes on Virginia in our next national semifinal. There is one sad piece of news to report today regarding that 10 Bears team. Tony Fulton, who was quoted several times in that piece, passed away a week ago today from pancreatic cancer. Obviously, we extend our condolences to his family. And as you look at that piece, Leaf, what goes through your mind, the legacy of this Ten Bears team? Well, it's an inspirational story that stands on its own, and I think what you have to think about is how far this country has come in 30 years. This story tells that story beautifully, and the fight that Miles Harrison went through to give his son the chance to, right now, be the accepted, accomplished, accomplished leader of the best lacrosse team in the country, and he's there solely because of his ability. That's a great story. It is indeed. We will see whether or not they actually are. The best lacrosse team in the country is the national semifinal coming up. Johns Hopkins comes in undefeated, ranked number one in the country, trying to get that elusive national championship trophy they haven't had since 1987. We'll be back getting you ready for that game momentarily.